Julia. Uh, she is a Ugandan jurist currently serving as a judge uh, on the International Court of Justice, ICJ. Uh, she is also the Chancellor uh, of the International Health Sciences University in Kampala, a position she has held since 2008. Uh, she is going to talk about the International Court of Justice holding sovereign states to account for human rights violations. You have the floor, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I take the opportunity also to thank our hosts, uh, uh, Mr. Ogmundu. And, and his team, and also the ICD, uh, for hosting us to this wonderful uh, roundtable conference. Last week, uh, we had an anniversary, a 70th anniversary of the International Court of Justice. And it was a time for us to really take stock of how the court has done. And, and for me, I think it's fitting uh, in this conference to talk about the role of the court and the challenges it, it has met in implementing human rights instruments. As you know, the, the role of the court, or the primary role, is, is to settle disputes between states, not individuals. And, and in doing so, um, the court does not make its own law. Instead, um, it, it applies what states have already agreed upon in terms of treaties, conventions, and even customary practice. So that is what the court does. Um, one of its handicaps, of course, is that human rights are rights accredited to humans or individuals or groups of individuals. And yet, these subjects do not have direct access to the court, especially where a state is the one violating the human rights. Uh, of, of an individual or of a group of individuals. Um, so access to court is, is problematic in that regard. But secondly, even where uh, a state would, uh, would be held accountable, it is not automatic unless that state has uh, agreed to subject itself to the jurisdiction of the court. So those are two primary handicaps or limitations within which framework the court um, has, to, has to operate. <coughs> Nonetheless, as a principal judicial organ of, of the UN, the court has tried in the last 70 years to play an important role in fulfilling the fundamental principles and objectives of the organization, which of course include the protection and promotion of human rights. This, um, I'm going to look at only three aspects and there are several aspects in which uh, the court does that, but I'm going to look only at three. The first is the way or the pronouncements that the court has made in relation to these important um, instruments, uh, as the, the, the first speaker has alluded to, that states very often make or sign and ratify these instruments. Um, and these instruments, at, at a, uh, to a large extent, remain on paper unless and until they're tested in the International Court of Justice and they're brought up for either application or for interpretation. And then the court has a role to play there. So the first aspect I'll, I'll, I'll speak about is the court's pronouncements on the status of human rights norms. Second, I will speak upon the position, uh, the court's position on the scope of the application of human rights instruments, and lastly, on the court's role in actually enforcing the human rights. So, um, as far as human rights are concerned, um, there is the famous Barcelona Traction case uh, of 1970, where the court identified a category of international obligations concerning the pr protection of basic human rights, uh, which obligations, it said, were owed to the international community as a whole. And, and which are by ver their very nature the concern of all states. These were, in a, to use a Latin phrase, obligations erga omnes. And in view of the importance of the human rights involved, these obligations could be invoked by any state. And in that case, the court singled out a number of obligations for states. For example, every state has the obligation to prevent acts of aggression. Every state has the obligation to prevent and punish genocide. 
to prevent slavery, to prevent racial discrimination, and every state must promote the right to self-determination in as far as they're able to. And of course, also certain fundamental principles of international humanitarian law, uh, which, for example, prohibit the murder of civilians in occupied territory, the deportation of civilian inhabitants to slave labor, and the deportation of prisoners of war to slave labor. All these were recognized by the court. Um, these, these are not things that you would find in a, in, in, in a, listed out nicely in a treaty, but by the court interpreting certain treaties in a given setting, within a certain uh, set of facts, the court came out with this kind of jurisprudence. Um, again, uh, in relation to its first um, role, which I've said is, is the, pronounce, the pronouncements that the court has made, uh, in relation to the uni Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Charter. The court has uh, pronounced itself on the binding nature of the human rights clauses in the UN, the UN uh, Charter, as well as the UN Declaration on Human Rights. In the advisory opinion on Namibia, or Southwest Africa, the court at that time held that the right to self-determination was a fundamental right and that the denial of such fundamental human rights was or is a flagrant violation of the purposes and principles of the UN Charter. And, and this was, of course, South Africa at the time was a member of the UN. It, it had trusteeship over a province that it had taken under its wings, uh, Southwest Africa. And within that province, they were still practicing apartheid. And they were denying the people of Southwest Africa the right to determine themselves. And this is where the court came in um, to say that. Um, Again, uh, talking about the UN uh, Declaration of Human Rights, in, in the Tehran hostages case, this was a case uh, where Iran um, had taken US hostages, diplomats hostage. The court said that it's wrongful, uh, to wrongfully deprive human beings of their freedom and to subject them to physical constraint in conditions of hardship is in itself manifestly incompatible with the principles of the UN Charter and of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So for Iran at that time, this was like a big blow for the court to say, Iran, you are wrong. There may not be a specific treaty, but within the UN Charter itself, what you are doing is incompatible with the principles there. So you, you cannot uh, be signatory to the UN Charter and continue to do what you're doing. Now on the scope of, of the application of human rights treaties, uh, the court uh, has also confirmed that human rights instruments continue to apply in, terms, in, terms, in, in times of armed conflict uh, and in the context of occupation. For example, in 2004, when the court was um, approached by the, the Security Council, or the, 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 I think it was the General Assembly, for an advisory opinion on Israel's construction of a wall in, in occupied uh, Palestinian territories um, and, and everything around what that construction, you know, the effect of the construction of that wall, the court confirmed that whilst the jurisdiction of a state is primarily territorial, that means um, Israel had jurisdiction to do whatever they wanted inside Israel, but Israel as a party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights the International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, and to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, was bound to apply those same conventions within occupied Palestinian territory where Israel exercised its jurisdiction. I think this was a big lesson to all states who venture outside of their territories and hope to do as they please to the people of those territories, because simply because they're occupied, they think that they will not be bound by the, the conventions that they've signed. And the message from the court was, yes, you are bound, and uh, you, you are bound to apply those conventions to the Palestinian people, 
uh, even though you, you consider them unoccupied um, people. A year later, in 2005, uh, in the case between Uganda and the DRC, or rather the DRC Congo uh, against Uganda in the uh, armed activities case, uh, the court also noted that um, international human rights instruments were applicable in respect of acts done by a state in the exercise of its jurisdiction outside its own territory. What that meant was that the, the, what, what the Ugandan uh, armed forces had done uh, in violation of human rights carried out on the territory of another state, the DRC Congo, was binding on Uganda. Uh, they, they, had, they were bound, just as they were, towards their own people to respect the human rights of the Congolese, um, especially considering that they were uh, on foreign territory. And of course, what happened was the, the court at that time condemned um, these, the country of Uganda to compensating and you know, paying reparations to the people of Congo based on, on that kind of judgment, uh, where Uganda, I think, had hoped that because they were acting or these, these acts took place on foreign soil, they would ne no one would uh, bring them to a book. And that's not what the court uh, said. Now, the, the third aspect, and, and I finish with this, is how the court has uh, enforced human rights. Now, d despite many jurisdictional obstacles, the court has had an opportunity, uh, one, uh, to enforce human rights directly through a finding of responsibility for violations. Usually, that is a declaratory relief. Um, before I joined the court, I, I didn't quite understand how that could be a relief. But I can assure you when the president of the court reads a judgment and says, uh, country X, uh, we declare, or we are judge and declare that country X is in violation of such, and such a treaty. It's like, if you like, naming and shaming that country uh, for breaching a treaty to which they should be um, beholden and to which they, which they should be upholding. So a finding of responsibility for violations, usually accompanied by an order for reparations, uh, is, is, is quite powerful. And of course, that's the second uh, way that the court acts, is through determination of appropriate remedies. And thirdly, through the indication of provisional measures aimed at protecting human rights pending a case being heard. Now, as examples of um, a, um, a finding of a violation, again, I'll give the, the well-known example of, of, of the, the advisory opinion of the court in the Israeli case. Now, remember, that was just an advisory opinion, and you might argue it was not binding. Israel didn't even bother to pitch. They, they, had no, uh, they made no statement at all. They weren't interested. And, and many states do that. A state will, will you know, file a case, like recently, we had a small state uh, known as the Marshall Islands take on the nine nuclear weapon states individually, one by one. Now, three of the states already um, had recognized the compulsory jurisdiction of the court and made their defenses, but six didn't even bother to, put in, to pitch in even a letter acknowledging that a case had been filed against them, even though the court wanted. So, so this is the way that the court or the system works, that sometimes you know, states, it's within their prerogative to respond or not to respond. In the wall advisory opinion, um, in addition to the court uh, giving a declaratory judgment or finding, it wasn't a judgment, but a declaratory finding that Israel was responsible for violations in the occupied territories, <coughs> The court went as far as saying that the, the Israel had to pay reparations to the victims and um, went quite far uh, in, in, in that regard. Um, there's another set of cases that's interesting um, where the court had given uh, what they call provisional or had indicated provisional measures against the United States uh, for I think there was a set of German nationals in the Lagrange case and a set of Mexican nationals in the Avena case 
who were incarcerated in domestic courts in the USA and were, had been convicted uh, of crimes, capital crimes, and their lives were in, in dire danger of, 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 you know, of execution. So these two states, Germany and Mexico, uh, filed cases in the International Court of Justice uh, to challenge um, the, the, to challenge the, the actions of, of, of the USA, claiming diplomatic protection for their subjects, and asking the court in the meantime, and until the case is heard, that these lives be uh, saved by the US courts not carrying out the execution, at least until the court has uh, listened. Of course, uh, the mighty US being what it is, uh, did not uh, oblige, uh, did not comply with the with the provisional measures, and all these people were executed. Uh, the, the statute of the court says that where a state does not uh, comply with the judgment of the court, the, the complaining state can access the United uh, Nations Security Council, and you can imagine what happened there when the states tried to take the United States um, to their Security <coughs> Council. Um, I think I want to close um, with, with the, the conclusion um, that despite the many procedural and jurisdictional hurdles, the ICJ remains fir firmly committed to upholding and enforcement of in international law of which human rights forms an integral part. As the world faces new challenges such as terrorism and religious extremism, and as individual human rights are more and more under threat of erosion by state action, it is my hope that the court will rise to the occasion in meeting the challenges ahead and in playing a leading role in developing relevant jurisprudence that will strengthen the observance and respect for international law. I thank you.